I'm so grateful to be with you all. I really do wish I was live with each and every single one of you, but I'm so happy and honored that we get to spend this time together to talk about the most important theme and subject in our own lives, building resilience and mental strength. Now, if you were in front of me right now as an audience, I'd say to you, how many of us know we need to build resilience and mental strength? And I'm pretty sure all of us would put our hands up right now, nod away, put your hands up, uh, say yes in the comment section. If you feel you want to build your resilience and your mental strength. The good thing is that building our resilience and building our mental strength is just like building a muscle. It's just the same thing. We can build it. We can train it. It's possible for each and every single one of us. Whether you feel you're already resilient or not, we can refine it further. Whether you feel that you already have mental strength or not, we can build it further. And today I'm going to share with you three key principles that will help us build our resilience and our mental strength. So if you're ready to go, say ready in the comments. I'm ready to dive in with you all as well. And I want to start with sharing something that underpins all of the three reflections I'm going to share with you today. Now, this equation that I'm about to share with you was told to me by one of the guests on my podcast around two years ago. Now, if you listen to my podcast on purpose, then you can guess which guest you think said this equation. And if you don't, then you can guess anyway. So the equation goes something like this. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Let me say that again. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Write it down. Take note of that. When my guest said this to me around two years ago now on my podcast, I've never been able to forget it. The reason why it's such a powerful equation is that we all go through pain. We all experience pain. And all of us, I'm sure, agree we all want progress. How many of you want progress when you're going through pain? And the key ingredient that's often missing is reflection. The amazing thing about that equation is if you remove the word reflection, you lose progress and all you're left with is pain. So today, what I'm going to share with you are three reflections that are going to help us turn our pain into progress, that are going to help us turn our challenges into mental strength and turn our obstacles into resilience. Now, for those of you who've been guessing, the guest that said that to me was none other than Ray Dalio, the author of Principles and the founder of Bridgewater Associates. It's a brilliant book, and I've learned a lot from Ray, who's a dear friend. Now, the first reflection that I want to share with you is a story that was often told by the Buddha. And this story is about a person, just like you and me, who was on a journey. And on their journey, they came across an obstacle. Now, we all know what that looks like. This person's obstacle, however, was a fast flowing, gushing river. And they needed to get to the other side. They knew that if they stepped foot inside the river, they would get swept away and taken away in a moment. So what they thought was that maybe they could float on a piece of wood or a plank of wood or something they could find. And they put that item into the river and whoosh, within seconds, that piece of wood was completely taken away. They faced failure and they realized that they needed something that was stronger. They decided to craft a raft. They laid down the bamboo both sides, they laid down some wood. They found some rope, tied up the corners this time. They weren't going to take any chances the second time. They even built an oar. This time they got on top with a little bit more confidence, but still a bit of anxiety. 
and they started to paddle as fast as they could, faster and harder and trying their best and putting all their energy and all their strength and all their might. And finally, they made it safely to the other side. When this person reached the other side, they thought to themselves, I was saved by this raft. I could never have done this without this raft. I have to take this raft everywhere with me. This raft saved my life. So they strapped the raft onto their back and decided to carry it wherever they went. As they went forward and as time passed, they came to a new obstacle, a new challenge in their life. And this time, the challenge wasn't a fast flowing river. It was a tall wooded forest with trees dotted at every other strip. So they tried to walk through the forest and every time they walked through their raft would just hit the tree and they'd try and maneuver it through and it would hit again and it would just keep knocking against it. And they realized that they were stuck. The Buddha says at this point, this person had a really important decision to make. They could either put down the raft and walk through freely, or they could hold on to the raft tightly and struggle to move forward. The person realized that what got them here will not, got them, will not get them there. The person realized that the raft that got them here will not help them get through. In this dilemma, with this decision, the person decided to take off the raft off their back, lay it down on the floor and move forward. Now, why am I sharing this story with you? I'm sharing this story with you because often we think resilience means taking more on, but resilience and mental strength are also built by knowing when to let go. When we let go, we create more space for what's good in our lives. When we let go, we stop holding on to a false expectation or a false ideal. How many of us have been holding on to a old normal? How many of us have been holding on to the way things were? And when we do that, we lose out on the opportunity to accept. Even if you think about your hands, if you're holding on to something, you don't have empty hands to take hold of something else. You can't accept the future. You can't accept the new because your hands are tied. They're occupied. So I want to ask you to reflect today. And you can write this down as well. Your reflection is what are you letting go of? What are you leaving behind? Even if it's uncomfortable at first, what are you ready to leave behind and let go of so that you can walk freely through the next challenge? Often what makes a challenge harder is we're holding on to the tools that are no longer useful. We're holding on to the habits and the mindsets that are no longer needed. We need new habits for a new time. I'm going to share with you four of the habits that we can make space for. And these four habits, you can practice them for two to three minutes each a day. That's a total of 12 minutes of your time and simply practicing these every day for two to three minutes each, you will get an opportunity to experience how you can build the muscle of resilience and mental strength. I want to put the power right into your hands. I want you to recognize that the power to heal, the power to transform, the power to grow yourself is within you when you practice these four habits. And these four habits come in the form of an acronym called TIME, T-I-M-E. The T stands for thankfulness. Gratitude is truly a superpower. And why? Not just because it sounds good, but because it's scientifically proven to boost your mood. It's scientifically proven to improve your immunity and build your bonds and relationships. But now many of you may keep a gratitude journal, or maybe you've heard that before, to write down what you're grateful for. There's a particular technique that actually accelerates gratitude to have the result that I just talked about. It's not just any type of gratitude. 
that has those amazing benefits. It's a specific type of gratitude. So this type of thankfulness, I want to share with you through a little exercise. I want you to think about two of your best friend's names outside of your family or your partners, two of your best friend's names and pick those names, write them down. And I want you to visualize that after this is all over and it's safe, you organize a party at your home and all your best friends come over and especially these two come over. Now, the next day after the party's over, your first friend messages you and says, hey, I had a great time, thanks so much, that's it. Your second friend messages you and says, oh my gosh, that was the best party ever. I loved meeting your family, they're beautiful. I love meeting all your other friends, they're amazing. The games were so fun and oh, don't even get me started on the food. That was the best buffet I've ever had in my life. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now, let me ask you a question. Which one of those messages fills your heart with more joy, more love, and more depth? The answer is obvious. It's the second one. Your second friend, whoever's name you gave, they're the one who got the credit for that message. But it's easy. Now, what's amazing about that is the reason why it has that impact is because gratitude and thankfulness to truly work needs to be personalized and specific. When thankfulness is personalized and specific, it has the ability to not only boost the mood of the receiver, but it actually boosts the mood of the giver. When we give thanks in a personalized and specific way, we're filled with joy. And when we receive thanks in a personalized and specific way, we're filled with joy. So here's my challenge for you. I want you to, for the next seven days, to text, voice note, voicemail, email, call, FaceTime, video message, whatever you want to do, one person a day from your personal or your professional life. You don't have to write a thesis. You don't have to make it rhyme. You can literally just send them what you're thinking, a short paragraph, two to three minutes. Send one of those messages every day for the next seven days and watch how your life changes. Try it out. Experiment with it. The second habit that we make time for is I, and it, believe, and it stands for inspiration. We wake up every day and we brush our teeth because our teeth feel unclean. We wake up and we eat some breakfast because we feel hungry. When we don't feel inspired, we need to eat inspiration. We need to consume inspiration. We need to make space to feel inspired, passion, inspiration, motivation. These are habits. They're habits. They have to be practiced every single day. Just as you don't say, oh, I ate enough food yesterday. I don't need to eat tomorrow. No, despite how much you ate yesterday and today, you know you eat to eat tomorrow. So no matter how many motivational videos you watched yesterday or how many inspirational books you read last month, we need to keep that practice. So every day when you wake up in the morning, Ask yourself, what's the first thing that you see? I want you to change the first thing that you see to being a quote that you love. It may be to turn on a song that inspires you. It may be to look at a picture of your family or a work of art as the first image you see in the morning, the first thing that you see in the day. For me, making it a quote that I love is, is such a special thing. In the past, I've listened to a podcast or I've listened to my favorite speeches as well. And so inspiration can also come through hearing. I remember at one point in my life, I listened to Steve Jobs's Stanford commencement speech every single day for nine months. And not only did I know all the words off by heart, but it really penetrated my heart as well. And I recently had the opportunity to interview Matthew McConaughey on my podcast. And I was sharing with him that at one point I listened to his Oscars acceptance speech every day for about a month. It's only about five minutes long and it is pure inspiration. So that for me have been some of the most powerful inspirational habits. The next one, T-I-M. M stands for meditation or mindfulness. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. Many of you are sitting there going, Jay, I've tried to meditate. I just fall asleep. I can't do that. Do not tell me to meditate. Do not me tell me to practice mindfulness, but I want to simplify it for you. You would never cancel an important meeting with someone else, but you never schedule one with yourself. How crazy is that? That you would never cancel an important meeting with someone else, but you never even schedule one with yourself. Meditation is time for yourself, with yourself, by yourself, even if it's three minutes a day. And I'm going to share with you what you do for that three minutes. Every day, I want you to spend three minutes with yourself and I want you to ask yourself one question. The question is, what is the one thing I need to do today in order to make today a great day? How many times have you had it in your life where you check off everything off your to-do list, you've completed all your tasks, but you still feel unfulfilled? You still feel like you're incomplete. It's because you haven't done the one thing that day that makes you feel like a success. It could be reading your kids a bedtime story. It could be making sure that you spoke to your partner about something. It could be closing off on a project. It could be uh, making sure you did something for yourself. It could be just sitting there and having your own tea or coffee to yourself. And that makes you feel more happy and successful than anything else. It's so important to take three minutes out to have that check-in with ourselves. T-I-M-E. The E stands for exercise. Movement is so important. It's so powerful. It's so needed in our lives. Whether it's a virtual dance party, whether it's a virtual workout, whether it's walking up and down your stairs, or whether it's planning your own commute. Most of us have lost our commute. Why not put in a five minute commute every morning where you walk up and down your street? or you walk up and down your garden if you have one, or you walk up and down your stairs. I promise you, you can trick your mind into thinking you're going somewhere, and that makes you feel like you have more space in your life. I also know that a lot of people have been using Fitbits or Aura Rings or all these different ways of measuring their steps, and turning it into a competition actually does help. I know people who are literally going for walks at 9 p.m. to beat their family in a game of 10,000 steps. That's right, it's a game now. Whatever it is that helps you have that movement in your life, these are the four habits. Now, the reason why I speak about these four habits is because these are the four habits I was trained in when I lived as a monk. So for those of you who do know, I lived as a monk for three years. And if you don't know, you just found out. Uh, I graduated from Cass Business School when I was 22 years old. And I turned down job offers in the city to go and live as a monk, mostly in India and traveling across Europe. In that time, we built sustainable villages, we fed the homeless and young children, we taught meditation, we studied, we focused on mind mastery in ourselves. And what I loved about living as a monk is that the morning was for yourself and the rest of the day was for service. So the morning was spent doing these four habits and practices, building up our own shield, putting on our own armor, getting prepared for the day, training for the day. And for the rest of the day, we were out serving and helping others. Similarly, in your work, you spend the whole day serving your family, your clients, your customers, colleagues, people that you work with. It's so important that you use your morning to get set for yourself. The amazing thing about these four habits is that if we start our day with them, they start us off on a positive note. There's something really, really interesting. Studies show that 80% of us, the first thing we see in the morning is our phones before we see our partners and before we see our kids. And the last thing we see at night is our phone after we see our partners and after we see our kids. Our phone gets more FaceTime than some of the people that live in our lives. Now, the amazing thing about waking up to your phone is, imagine you wake up and you're at zero, right? You're at neutral. When you wake up to your phone, you're waking up to news, notifications, negativity, and noise. I don't need to tell you that, you already know it. So you start your day on a minus four and you spend the rest of your day trying to get back up 
to zero if you're lucky, probably at a minus one. But if you start your day with thankfulness, inspiration, meditation, exercise, you start your day at a plus four. Now, even if the day is tough and we know our days can get tough, you end up at a plus one. It's incredible to see how starting off strong sets us up for a better day than starting off weak and trying to make up for it later. It gets harder and harder as the day goes on. Just like traffic gets worse, the traffic in our mind gets worse to really center ourselves and feel focused. So I want us to remember those four habits as the first principle and reflection on developing mental strength and resilience. I hope you're with me. I hope that makes sense. I hope that connected. I hope I've given you some new ideas and new ways of rethinking some of these old habits. And I hope you've really reflected on what you can let go of. I now want to move to reflection number two and principle number two. This is about how you build mental resilience and strength in your work day, but also how you build it with your colleagues and how you plan and create a vision for success. We've talked about what we need to let go of. Now, how do we need to reorganize and edit our lives so that we can actually achieve our goals, so that we can actually achieve our targets, so that we can actually achieve our dreams? Because I know all of you sitting there have targets, have goals, have dreams. I know all of you have the ability and the potential inside of you, but sometimes we need to edit a few things to make sure that we actually get there. I read a study a few years ago that absolutely changed the way I work. The study said that you can't be logical and creative at the same time. What that means is, if I'm in a brainstorm meeting, I can't suddenly go to a numbers meeting and perform. I can't move from a data meeting to an innovation meeting and perform. I can't move from an innovation meeting to a statistics meeting and perform. You can, and you might be able to get away with it for a few years, but you're literally stretching and potentially snapping your mind's ability to actually do that. We function better when we time block, logical time and creative time. Logical time is structured tasks, numbers tasks, planning tasks, scheduling tasks, and creative is obvious, brainstorm, innovation, uniqueness, diversity, anything that requires that right, right side of our brain. So what I do now is I do logical days and creative days, logical mornings and creative afternoons, creative mornings and logical afternoons. As much as I can create distinctions between these times, I'm actually able to increase my mental focus. I found this study that I was sharing for Think Like a Monk, which was the idea that we believe that we're really good at multitasking. How many of you, be honest, think you're a pretty good multitasker? Well, studies show that only 2% of people in the world are actually good multitaskers. And the funniest thing about that is, the study says that when most people hear that, they think they're in that 2%. <laughs> <laughs> and the odds are that we're not in that 2%. Uh, most of us are in the 98%. We're recommended to do single tasking, putting our mind and energy into one thing at a time. Imagine right now I was talking to you, but I was also emailing and I was also on my phone. A, this would be the worst speech of all time, but B, also you'd feel that energy. And I'd also be distracted. Single tasking or monotasking, as it's often known, is a great skill to apply that logical and creative mindset towards achieving your dreams. If you wanna get to your dreams, you have to go all in. You have to go all in focused and immersed in that space. You can't be distracted and disturbed and planning your schedule in such a way allows you to reach optimal performance. Another thing that's really huge about going all in is this amazing thought by Albert Einstein. So Einstein once said that everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid, right? Think about that. We are birds trying to swim. We are fish trying to climb trees. We are whatever animal you want to pick trying to do the wrong thing. If you saw a bird, you'd be like, but you can fly. Like, why are you trying to swim? 
And if you saw a fish trying to fly, you'd be like, but you're a fish, you can swim. Why are you trying to do that? But we do that to ourselves all the time. We do that to ourselves all the time. We don't recognize our own strengths. We don't recognize our own abilities. Research shows when they looked at how the most healthiest, wealthiest, and wisest people spend their time. Imagine I was to give you 100 hours of self-development. I was going to invest in 100 hours of your self-development. How would you divide 100 hours into what you're good at, what you're average at, and what you're bad at? Would it be 95-5? Would it be 50 uh, 25, 25, would it be 33, 33, 33? Would it be 20, 20, 60? How would you divide it? Think about that for a moment. Research shows that the healthiest, wealthiest, and wisest people, when they ask that question, it will be 100, 0, 0, or 80, 10, 10. We have to go all in on what we're naturally good at and gifted at and have strengths in, because when we do that, we can become exceptional at those things. It's phenomenal to see how exceptional you can become at something that you're already naturally gifted at and that you're passionate about. And there may be other things that you're interested in, curious about, which you're not good at yet, but you're willing to put in the work. You're willing to develop an expertise. Remember, don't confuse inexperience with weakness. We think just because we haven't done anything before, we're weak at it. We can build it and we can grow. There's a beautiful conversation between Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, everyone knows who that is. And Steve Wozniak, for those of you who don't know, is the engineer, the tech brains behind Apple. I recently had the fortune of sitting down with Walter Isaacson on my podcast On Purpose. And uh, Walter Isaacson actually spent time with Steve Jobs to write his biography. You know, he's one of my favorite authors. And there's a interaction that happens between Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. And Steve Wozniak looks at Steve Jobs and he says, what do you even do? Can you imagine saying that to Steve Jobs or even your boss? Steve Wozniak says, what do you even do? You're not a marketer, you're not an engineer, you're not a tech person, what do you even do? And Steve Jobs in Steve Jobs' fashion replies, musicians play their instruments, I play the orchestra. Now, the reason why I'm sharing that story is because Steve Jobs wasn't the best marketer or engineer or artist or whatever it was, but he knew that his skill set was bringing the team together to create, you know, one of the most innovative products of our time. Knowing your strength, knowing your abilities and your skills allows you to have a much greater impact and then surrounding yourself with people that have the complementary skills and abilities in your life. In the beginning, you may have to do it all, but the more and more you can in your career, in your industry, that you can go all in and really analyzing what are your skills? What are your strengths? Because you have them. And if you don't know, go and ask the people that you've worked with professionally and personally and ask them, what do you think are my greatest strengths? What do you think are my greatest skills? Sometimes there are our own boundaries. Sometimes there are our own blind spots. We're not even aware. And we miss out on our own potential. No one wants to work with you on what you're average at. People want to work with you on what you're impactful at. That's the difference. Try and uncover what that is. What makes that difference? What makes that impact in your life? And inside of that, I wanted to share this idea with you. It comes from a book called Flow, one of my favorite books that I've read, and it talks about this flow state. And this flow state is what we see musicians achieve when they're just singing and it feels like they're channeling or you see a, a, mus uh, you see a musician or you see an athlete that is just in the zone. It's about being in the zone. It's about feeling like you've lost all sense of where you are and who you're with, you're just so fixated on your goal and what you're working on. And we all want to experience that in our, in our careers and our lives. It's said that we all experience flow state when our challenge meets our skills. So when our skills and our challenges meet, that's where we feel flow state. When our challenge is above our skills, 
we feel frustrated, we feel disappointed, we feel annoyed. When our skills are above our challenge, we feel bored. We feel like we're wasting time, we feel lazy. So ask yourself, reflect right now, do you need to scale your challenge or do you need to scale your skills? To experience flow state, there's some lack of alignment there. There's some part of that that's not fitting right, that's not matching, that there isn't synergy on. Is it that your skills are too high and your challenge is too low? Or is it that your challenge is too high and your skills are too low? Most people are missing a skills gap. It's not that we don't have the potential. It's not that we don't have the skills. It's not that we don't have the ability inherently within us. It's because we've stopped investing in our own growth. We've stopped investing in our own power. I invest in coaching all the time. I really believe in coaching, whether it's physical, mental, emotional. I'm surrounded by coaches and mentors in my life so that I'm always improving, that I'm always getting better. Some of those coaches may be in books. They may not even be people that I've ever known. I really believe you can be mentored by people you've never met. You can truly be transformed by people just by studying their story. You don't have to know them personally. You don't have to be able to call them on the phone. You truly, truly can. So I encourage you with that second reflection to reflect on what are your strengths? Where do you need to put the spotlight? And then what are the weaknesses that you have that you can build up and strengthen in order to meet your challenge? It may even be a skill that you have that you just haven't trained in a while and it just needs developing. It just needs to be built up. It's really, really important to figure that out. I remember uh, I, was, I went to watch uh, my good friend, Russell Brand perform in London quite regularly uh, in the past. And when I went to see him speak once, he said, he said, People don't realize how many times you have to practice that so that it appears spontaneous. I thought that was such an incredible way of putting it. That to really for it to feel effortless and for it to come off and, and really be in flow state, it had to be so deeply practiced. I want to share with you now one last reflection. And this is around purpose. We talked about the habits needed for mental strength and resilience. We talked about the edits that are needed in our day to make us more have a powerful vision of success and what we need to make our vision of success become clear. And the third is creating purpose in our life. We all need to feel a sense of purpose, don't we? But often, have you found this? That the pursuit of purpose paralyzes your potential. Sometimes this obsession with, I don't know what my purpose is, I don't know where I'm gonna find it, I'm confused about my purpose, where do I start, what do I do now, kind of just stops us from actually living our purpose. The first way is to bring your passion into your work. Whatever you're passionate about outside of work, outside of your company, bring it in. Bring it into your work conversations. Bring it into your meetings, bring it into your energy of your clients and customers, because I promise you, it will make you so much more powerful and unique. Because what we're all missing today is a human purpose, a human connection to someone as a human, not as a robot, not as a social media profile, but as a human. I want to share with you a amazing story of a study conducted by Amy Wrzniewski and her team at the Yale School of Management. They set out to think about what they believed was the most difficult job in the world, a big task. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, disclaimer, that job was not my job and it was not your job either. I promise you it was not the hardest job in the world. There was something harder. <clears throat> the job they decided to choose was hospital cleaners. They found through all their research that the most difficult job in the world 
was the job of a hospital cleaner. Why? Because they had to clean up rooms, they had to clean up canteens, they had to clean up after people ate, they had to clean up after people used the restrooms and the toilets, they had to clean up after people passed away. Now, an extremely difficult job. So whenever they went to interview these cleaners, <clears throat> they asked some of them, what do you do every day? And they'd say, we clean, we do janitor style work, housekeeping style work, admin style work, we're cleaners. They described themselves as low skilled labor. They then asked some other cleaners what they did every day. Now bear in mind, these cleaners did exactly the same work in the same hospitals. When they were asked to describe themselves in one word, they used the word healers. They did the same exact job in the same hospital. Some cleaners described themselves as cleaners. Some described themselves as healers. Why? Because the ones that described themselves as healers saw them as part of the healing journey of the patient and the patient's family. They saw themselves as carers, as supporters, as people who are integral into the healing journey of the patient and the patient's family. They saw themselves as part of that. And because of that, they came to work with a fresh perspective, with a deep sense of purpose. They did the same work and the same job. But as Amy Wisniewski and her team coined it, job crafting. People who were able to edit or craft their jobs, meaning to what they were doing it for and why they were there, transformed what they felt. And as Wayne Dyer said, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Right? When, when, Dyer, when Wayne Dyer said that, it completely moved me. When we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Sometimes we need to look up from our devices. We need to look up from our laptops. We need to look beyond our PowerPoint presentations. We need to look beyond our Excel spreadsheets. We need to look beyond our screens and really ask ourselves, what is the purpose of our work? Is it helping you take care of your family and your children and give them a great education? Is it helping you provide for someone you love? Is it helping you take care of customers and clients and their families? What is really happening behind the scenes beyond that Excel spreadsheet, that little conflict, that deal that didn't work out? What is truly, truly, truly going on? That's what purpose is. Purpose is the deep reason for why you get up in the morning. And we all have it. We all have it and we can all have it in the work we have if we simply reflect. If we simply give ourselves that opportunity to reflect. So today we started with Ray Dalio's amazing words of pain plus reflection equals progress. I gave you three reflections, one reflection for what you need to let go of and the habits to make space for. One reflection for what are your true strengths that you need to invest in and what are the weaknesses either in your challenge or your skills to get to that flow state. And the third reflection I asked you to do just now is to reflect on your reason for turning up and the true impact of your work. Not the amount of money, but what you do with it to really think about the impact, the positive impact you have on your clients and the people around you, the things that your work provides for with your own family and the people that you love. Those three reflections are where all of the resilience is. I'm going to end with one last story that I want to share with you. And this story is a personal one. When I moved on from being a monk to coming back to the real world, uh, I, this was around eight years ago now, and I really didn't know what I was going to do. I was extremely lost and confused because I'd been a monk for three years. And surprise, surprise, I was rejected by 40 companies 
uh, because they didn't want someone with monk on their resume. They were wondering, what's your transferable skills? Being quiet and sitting still, we definitely don't need anyone who can do that. And so I was going through a lot of rejection. I was going through a lot of failure. I was going through a lot of setback. 40 companies rejected me without an interview, by the way. And it was at that time that all of my monk training came into practice. It was at my lowest point, at the point where I was experiencing the most amount of pain, that the same principles I've just shared with you today came to my rescue. It was amazing for me to see that being a monk was like being at school, and the last eight years have been the exam. And I've just given you my cheat sheet and my code for the exam. What I've shared with you today are just not ideas and concepts, they are tried and tested tools and principles that I've, I've employed over the last eight years to find my place in the world, to find my purpose, to build resilience, to get through the tough times, and to develop the habits and practices so that I can try to serve you all today and serve through all the work I do. It's in these moments, the tough moments, the tough years, that you look back and have your best memories when you choose to move out of them, when you choose to build out of them, when you choose to lay the bricks, when you choose to pave the path at this time, those are the moments that will count, I promise you. Now I've shared a lot of ideas with you today and a lot of different tools and insights and takeaways, a lot of strategies and steps. And I have just one recommendation for you. Don't try and do it all at the same time. I want you to just pick one thing that resonated with you and I want you to do it tomorrow, every day for seven days and watch how your life changes. Thank you so much for listening. I'm so grateful we got to spend this time together and I'm so excited to head back to David uh, and for you to hear about next steps. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for all the love on Instagram and social media. Just before I came live, I was browsing through my DMs and I saw so many of you tagging this event. I appreciate each and every one of you. I'm gonna be trying to share as many of them as I possibly can as well as uh, to keep a lookout later on. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Jay. I mean, there's, there's literally thousands